This is a random thing for me to bring up. Remember that weird book you might have read in your fifth grade English class called Maniac McGee? It was written by Jerry Spinelli and was published in 1990. Maniac McGee was a truly insane book about a kid who ran away from home and found himself in a racially separated small town in Pennsylvania. The book details his experiences there. Maniac McGee quickly became a bestseller and won Jerry Spinelli the Newbery Medal just the next year. So, you do remember that. Maybe? Well, guess what? Thirteen years after the book was published, in 2003, Nickelodeon made a Maniac McGee movie. You think this movie might be good? You're fucking insane! I really question the relevance of this movie. I mean, the movie wasn't even aired in theaters. It was just a film that aired on TV for kids to randomly come across. I mean, a majority of the viewers in 2003 probably had no idea what they were watching. Most of them, I'd assume, were waiting for Jimmy Neutron to come on or something while they were watching this. Currently, the film is often used in the classroom simply to compare it to the book. You know, like a lot of other similar book-based films. That's pretty much its entire legacy today, though! And that's how I even know of the film! No one would ever watch this movie had they not known about the book. You want to know how bad this movie is? Well, keep watching. Because here's my review. The movie starts off with the narrator introducing a boy named Jeffrey Lionel McGee, nicknamed Maniac McGee, as a local legend in a town known as Two Mills, Pennsylvania, a town that's, by the way, not actually real. The movie is told in flashback, wait, what? The book wasn't told in flashback, so what's the point of changing the narration style? As the flashback begins, we cut to a scene where Maniac McGee is talking to his parents as they leave the house. I need to mention that during this conversation, his parents mention a stop ball technique. The characters throw this stop ball word around and you'll find out what it means at the end of the movie! Because, you know, throwing a word around that makes absolutely no sense to the viewers is a great way to keep people's attention! Unfortunately, Maniac's parents never make it back alive, since a drunk driver hits them and kills them both. We cut to the funeral scene when suddenly two unfamiliar adult figures show up. Whoa, dude, personal space much? Jeffrey McGee, I am Officer Curdle, Dan Curdle, from Family Court. This is Miss Freeze. Dottie to you. I'm from the orphanage, Jeffrey. We'll need you to come with us now. We'll need you to come with us now. Don't worry, kid. I've got some candy. Come on. So, being understandably freaked out by Mr. and Mrs. Pedophile, Maniac runs away. No! What? What are you looking at? Look, I like candy, alright? I, I offered it to you once and you didn't take it, so what the hell? He runs away and the adults aren't even making any effort to chase after him. They aren't even yelling for him to come back or anything. Come on, guys, you gotta act some. Maniac runs and runs and runs. All across the United States, throughout the entire duration of the opening intro. After the intro, Maniac McGee comes across the town of Two Mills, PA the setting of the rest of the movie. Two Mills was your average everyday small town, except for one tiny little thing. It was founded by a man who did not believe that blacks and whites should live together. The line running straight through the center of the town made sure of that. It also made sure that the Easties and the Westies would never get along. So Maniac starts exploring the town when he comes across... Big John McNabb. A behemoth of a boy who got his thrill striking out kids so often, the only hit they- Really? Giving characters name tags and explaining their life story? Ass! I mean, I often complain about not explaining enough, but here they're explaining it in the completely wrong way! More creative writers would, I don't know, introduce the characters through the flow of the story and not through the fucking narrator. This isn't an encyclopedia, it's a fucking movie! Next victim! Maniac runs into the baseball field and takes on the challenge of batting against John, who's known to routinely strike out every kid in town at ease. 
but Maniac beats the crap out of John. Twice. How could it just catch fire in the air like that? It, that shit doesn't happen! There have been players who have batted balls both higher and faster than that without the balls catching fire. Then John pitches something else other than a baseball at Maniac to make him look like a fool. Wanna guess what he pitched? Wanna guess? A frog. A fucking frog. Which even the movie itself admits is incredibly stupid. John's plan doesn't work though, and after Maniac wins the game, he runs off. Hey, get him! So, after running off, Maniac crosses over to the East End, much to the offense of the Easties, of course. In the East End, he comes across a schoolyard and meets a girl named Amanda Beal. Oh, by the way, want to hear how the movie explains what I just said? <laughs> You're gonna love this! He happened to turn left at the karate school, right at the pet hospital, and straight into Amanda Beal and her suitcase. Why are we given so many useless details here? The karate school and the pet hospital are never seen in the whole movie and are never mentioned again! You know, I have the feeling that this movie would have been much better without that annoying narrator. Narration is for books and documentaries, not live-action kids' movies. I understand they were trying to make it like the book, or... a book. Okay, never mind, there's simply no excuse. Anyway, Maniac and Amanda talk to each other about how much they love books. He begs to borrow one of her books, and after a moment of deliberation, Amanda accepts. Maniac promises to bring it back to her in mint condition. But later, as he's reading the book, he's approached by a new character, Mars Bar Thompson, the local bully of the East End. What you reading? That's not mine. Give it back, please. It's mine. I'm taking it. Maniac grabs it back, and one of the pages rips. But shortly afterwards, Amanda confronts Mars about it, and he leaves. You get him, girl. I'm not gonna forget this! Let's go! Maniac claims he can fix the book, so Amanda takes him to her house. At Amanda's house, after fixing the book, Maniac has supper with Amanda's family. Maniac stays a little longer after dinner, and afterwards, Amanda's father drives Maniac home. Except Maniac doesn't have a home. So he ends up admitting his real situation to Mr. Beale, Amanda's father, and he forgives him. Amanda's family then allows Maniac to stay at their house. whoop de doo Maniac McGee finally has a home. The next morning... In here, Jeffrey. Sneakers! And no red! You, you don't understand. I can run fast in black, I can even run faster in red. Why? What, is, what does color have anything to do with how fast you run? Is it... A placebo? So, here's a good question to ask. In a movie about racism, how long is it gonna be before they slip a racist joke in there? It's not coming off. It's not painted on. I just haven't been out in the sun very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 20 minutes in. I'm shocked. Well, yeah, Maniac McGee doesn't know anything about racism, so I guess it could be excusable for him to make a racist joke. But no, this wasn't his ignorance, this was the writer's ignorance. I'm sorry, but that joke just really wasn't funny. Not even because it was racist, but just because it was lame. Oh, yeah, that reminds me. How could Maniac McGee just be completely clueless about racism anyway? Didn't they ever talk about that kind of stuff in fucking grade school? Like the antebellum period, the civil rights movement, civil war, does any of that stuff ring a bell? I mean, for just an ordinary, lazy kid, I might let it slide, but Maniac McGee is like this image of a perfectly innocent, outgoing, healthy, bright kid who always does everything right. So he'd pay attention in school, obviously! Good God! In a later scene, Maniac creates a tent for Amanda with all the stuff she likes in it. Oh, and here's the opening narrating line to this scene. It's usually the big things Maniac McGee did that get all the hoopla. Amanda! But for Amanda, on, the little something. things matter just as much. Little my ass! Th 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 this is a huge tent! And when I say all the stuff she likes is in there, I do mean everything. Semantics do matter. Hey is for Ardmar. Hey is for Ardwolf. I know I never heard of it either, but... It's in there, and I bet there's an R dog and an R cat. There's and... no such thing. 
Well, there should be. Hey, can't you? I bet there's an R to Amanda. Ah, you hit me. <laughs> you deserved it. R to Amanda. Well, then R to Amanda. What? Then R to Amanda. I'm sorry. Could you could you repeat that for me, please? I I didn't quite catch that. Artamando? Was that supposed to be funny? I mean, that's just a slight alteration of her name. That's not a joke. That'd be like, hey, 2000s critic, what's up, man? Hey, Andro. <laughs> that was so funny. That was so funny, wasn't it? What? Oh, oh, oh you don't get it? <laughs> How could you not get it? I I changed the ooh in your name to oh. <laughs> it's pure comedy gold. <laughs> what the, the? That's not funny. Fuck you. I'm leaving. In a later scene, Amanda's favorite book, Encyclopedia A, which was in the tent earlier, was found to be damaged by Mars Bar Thompson and his gang. A funeral for a fucking encyclopedia? Oh, come on. Nobody fucking does that. I wouldn't even do that if my phone, computer, or video game systems broke, and those are my favorite things ever. Look, I understand. People love books, but not even the biggest bibliophiles would ever go as far as to create a gravestone and bury a damaged book and hold a fake funeral service for it. That's beyond bibliophilia. That's more like insanity. I can find another one. Wow, you think? Maniac McGee runs away from the Beale family. And... I'm really, really, really not kidding here when I say this. He runs away because of the book! I swear to God that is true. He runs away over a book. I mean, and it's not even like the book is rare or anything. It's just an encyclopedia volume A. I mean, I could go, I could go to the library any time and find one of those. That's like if somebody ran away from home because they lost a penny. Anyway, Maniac goes to the West End and finds Piper and Russell, the little brothers of John McNabb from earlier in the film. He finds that they're trying to run away from home, and Maniac tries to persuade them not to. But, but, but Maniac ran away from home! Twice! Hypocrite much? Older brother John McNabb finds them and gets angry, but Maniac tells a good story about his stop-ball technique, one that's totally confusing and out of context. Because John McNabb likes the bullshit story Maniac just pulled out of his ass, he gains respect for Maniac and invites Maniac over to their house. In times like this, let's remember our founding father, Alexander Graham Mills, great, great granddaddy on your mama's side. By the way, this PTSD dad, he's batshit insane. Just wait until you see this. Dad McNabb is even more racist than most of the other white characters in the movie. So much that he has another Two Mills Founding Father statue in his front yard, which he practically worships. But he worships something else, too. You guys want to guess what it is? Want to guess? Jesus? No. Beans! Yes, you heard me right. Beans, as in the fruit! That... That is so beyond random. The motivation for his obsession with beans is never explained, either. Well, my words, boy, they ain't gonna try to take them away from us. Who, sir? The Easties. That's why they keep talking about battling us. But what they really want is our beans. Did I mention that as a kid, beans were my least favorite food? And this guy has a house full of them. That's all he feeds his kids every day. No, seriously. This would be a nightmare for me. You got a problem with beans, mister? You better think about that. So Maniac gets to stay with the McNabs for a while as he continues to persuade young Piper and Russell not to run away from home. Because it's not okay to run away from home if your father is an insane hyper-racist PTSD psychopath who worships beans, but it is okay to run away from home if an encyclopedia gets damaged. What the hell?! To keep the kids from running away, Maniac carries out several dares for them, such as... this. Kissing a rhinoceros? Oh, just You're a Dude, that's bordering on bestiality. And this movie's supposed to be for kids. But 
this part of the story comes to an end when Maniac pisses off Dad McNabb after admitting that he once lived on the east side of town. You didn't drink out of the same glass when you were over there, now, did you? Absolutely, I did. You kidding me? No, sir, they're just people like us. They are not. Or not, or not, or not, or not, or not. Or not, 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 or not. Are you annoyed yet? So Maniac decides to go back to the East End. He meets up with Amanda again and tells her he has a plan to convince the McNabs not to be so bitter with the Easties. The plan involves Mars Bar Thompson. And I gotta show you this, because this is actually one of the only funny scenes in the movie. You better be scared of me, because I'm bad. I'm so bad, I'm almost afraid to wake up in the morning because of how bad I might have got overnight. Ain't that right, man? You're the baddest, Snickers. Don't be calling me no Snickers. You better believe I'm bad. Or I'll just have to prove it. I'm bad, too. I'm so bad, I think I might be half black. Yo, mama. Well, you're a great aunt. What? Well, your distant cousin this cat's crazy. Okay, okay, I gotta give this movie credit. It gave me one good joke that I actually laughed at, okay? This is very clever use of naive child humor. And I love naive child humor. Maniac and Amanda dare Mars to go to the West End with the rest of his gang to go to Piper McNabb's birthday party. This is the climax of the movie, as their plan doesn't exactly work out at first. Mars and his gang show up, and a racial war ensues. Now I'm gonna count. Time I hit zero, I wanna see three of you out of here. Especially you. Hey, your little friend. Dad McNabb runs out to find a most dreadful sight. The founder's statue in his front yard was defamed. Jeez, you lusty freaks, you... I'm sorry, what? Jeez, you lusty freaks, you... Okay, whatever. The movie's almost over. All clear, fire! Wait, 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 wait. So they don't want the Easties to steal the bean cans, but they're gonna shoot the bean cans at them? That's like if during a historical war, instead of using guns or bows and arrows or swords, they throw gold coins at each other. The war scene ends as Piper falls off a ledge. Mars Bar saves Piper's life by catching his fall. Then, a stone from the same ledge falls, and John saves Mars Bar's life. After this, everybody makes up. Because of this, the East End and the West End are disestablished, and everyone in the town can live in unity. So they commemorate... What's that young man's name? Mars Bar's Thompson. One gun salute in honor of Mars Bar's Thompson. Mars Bars Thompson? I'm sorry, I know this is a minor complaint, but I thought his name was Mars Bar Thompson. Movie, you gotta be consistent. And this isn't the only time they misspell stuff. See, in the ending credits here, they spell Beal with an E at the end, and here they don't. But I'm getting too far ahead of myself here. They shoot the statue of the founder's head off. After this, the line that separated the town literally just disappears. How does that make any- Oh, god damn it, just a few more minutes. So, Amanda talks to Maniac and tells him that he can now live with her and her family. And that's the end of the movie. Wait, no, I forgot about the flashback thing, so almost. It's now revealed that the narrator is an older version of Amanda. She states now that Maniac later got married to Amanda. Well, okay, they were very young when they started living together after that previous scene. If they lived together all that time, I think they'd become more like brother and sister than they were going to get married. I mean, they were being raised by the same freaking parents. Maniac is essentially an adopted brother to her, not a fucking husband. What the hell? Incest? Sort of? Almost? Ish? So, at the very last moment, they finally show Maniac Jr. Yeah, they had a son doing this stop ball technique that they kept randomly referencing earlier in the movie. The ball appearing to be pitched by an older Maniac McGee. Now wait, wait a minute here. Never mind the physical impossibility factor of the stop ball, but even if somebody could do that, wouldn't that be considered cheating? I mean, think about it. That's like if in the game Space Invaders, you used a cheat code to freeze everything else in the game but you, and then shot all the enemy ships. It kinda defeats the fucking purpose of the game! Well, that's the Maniac McGee movie. Final words? Well, the movie was definitely bad, 
Most of the acting was mediocre at best, the writing was mediocre at best, and a lot of the jokes they seemed to try and tell weren't funny. The narration is probably the most annoying part of the movie, since most of the narrating lines are honestly pretty unnecessary. But, though the movie was bad, it certainly isn't one of the worst I've ever seen. I could see why the movie might bore or confuse a lot of people, but it's at least mildly watchable in my opinion. I mean, the movie did give one really funny joke, and that's more than I could say about a lot of bad movies I've seen. Like I said before, the only reason anyone would ever want to watch the Maniac McGee movie is to compare it to the book, most likely in a classroom setting, and that's why you'll never hear anyone talking about this. Honestly, it's pretty good for comparison. The movie has its differences from the book, just like any book-based movie, but I will still say the overall plot direction generally remains loyal. My concluding statement is that, in my opinion, Maniac McGee just wasn't a very good book to make a movie out of, and this movie shows you exactly why. <sighs> well, since I had to sit through this awful movie, I have an announcement to make. I have decided to run away from home. I'm the 2000s critic. And I never leave my past behind me. Legend. Well, it's been running ever since.